We are now officially over halfway done The Mandalorian Season 3, as last night saw the release of Chapter 21, The Pirate. Now, I'll admit I have some mixed feelings on this episode, and it's sort of, to me, been a pretty good representation of issues I've been having throughout this season. As always, though, before we continue, full spoiler warning, and I am going to also try to get a Bad Batch review episode for the final two episodes of Season 2 up either today or tomorrow. Alright, so as mentioned, Chapter 21 of The Mandalorian was called The pirate and saw the Mandalorian alongside his allies, return to Navarro this time as liberators to help out Grief Karga and really establish a new base for themselves. I've got to say I actually quite like that idea. It means Grief Karga keeps being involved in the show, the Mandalorians move away from that ridiculously dangerous planet they were living on, and it's just sort of an evolution of that storyline which I'm a fan of. So as with a lot of the Mandalorian this season, the basic idea has been pretty good. For me, the issue has largely been in execution. And I tweeted earlier that this season really feels like it just needed more editing, and to me that's true in pretty much most facets. The writing has been even clunkier than usual, and I do give The Mandalorian some leeway with this. It's definitely more of a space western than something like Andor. I don't expect either the same complexity or tightness, but when it comes to both dialogue and how the action is written, a lot of the times it just feels like we're moving from point A to point B, because that's how the writer wanted it, rather than a natural series of events which cause each other and sort of cause the story to happen naturally. I think a really good example of this was Carson Teva in this episode. For one, I don't think it needed to be him. Every time so far the Mandalorians interacted with the New Republic, it's been Carson Teva. And I think this is partially because of changes made to the story after the canceling of Rangers of the New Republic, but it just felt like him getting that message, him going to Coruscant, him having the conversation, well, well, perhaps Moff Gideon's spy is standing right there. It's all just a little, I guess, unnecessary. It like it lacks any sort of timeliness. We're meant to believe that these like 40 people ran out of town were just hiding in the mountains as he's taking days to travel through hyperspace and meet people in the New Republic. And there's even ways this could have been fixed. He could have simply called Mando before going off on his mission, or he could have stopped to visit Mando first. Or ideally, I think those storylines could have just been kept separate, with Grief Karga being the one to call Mando and and Carson Teva, or just the New Republic generally, also getting the message. That, however, to me is a pretty small complaint, not one that ruins the episode, or certainly impacts my feelings on the season overall. Where I am starting to have a bit more problems, though, is the overall handling of the Armorer, the Mandalorian cult, and the Mandalorian sort of as a character and how he interacts with those things. The first two seasons of The Mandalorian were largely about Din Djarin sort of fighting against his conditioning. It's clear he's in at least some sort of cult. Not a cult that's only negatives, but I think as with most cults in real life, which really restrict behavior, but which do offer a sense of community. He takes his helmet off on multiple occasions, it's presented in the show as an unambiguously good thing, he takes it off to say goodbye to his son, he takes it off to save Grogu in another example, but even though, as I said, these are unambiguously good things, the cult just doesn't care. We also see him again in other occasions, like in the Widower, fighting against happiness because of his conditioning. In season 3 now, we've had Bo-Katan join the cult, it's sort of unclear what her purpose is, whether she's enjoying the community, whether she sees them as a potential instrument in a bid for power. And this episode has the armorer sort of seeing that Mandalorians can maybe coexist, that there can be two different ways of walking the path of Mandalore. Now, I actually don't mind this, especially where there have been some really mystical moments for the Mandalorians, the return of the Darksaber, the finding of the Mythosaur. But I don't want the show to just end it like that. I don't want the idea to be that, oh, we've got to team up, everything is fine. I really like the story of the Mandalorian breaking from his conditioning, and I don't think it's necessary to present both the cult and the rest of the Mandalorians as equally good. I also just don't understand the ending. Why did they tie the Mandalorians into whatever's going on with Moff Gideon? The Moff Gideon stuff has also been kind of weird. I feel like that scene could have taken place earlier on in the season, rather than sort of the rumored name drops of him just disappearing. That's a small complaint, but I mean, even though the show is called The Mandalorian, not everyone needs to be involved in Mandalorian culture. I don't need to see, you know, Mandalorian Moff Gideon. I wonder whether there's going to be more 
more to his backstory, how he acquired the Darksaber, maybe how he was leading a small squad of commandos or Mandalorian warriors during his power. But to me, that was like the worst and cheesiest way to end what was a very cool sequence. I actually really liked Carson Teva discovering the Lambda shuttle. I thought it might be Thrawn. However, when they got inside the ship and I could tell they were scanning for something and going to discover something, I was like, Thrawn's not going to leave a chase. There's no way to tie it to him directly. So I don't know. For me, this episode had both small and, to be honest, medium issues in execution, but also some, I don't know, questionable decisions when it comes to the show's overall story. I just feel like sometimes this season is very clearly taking place as a midpoint between two much larger things. They had The Mandalorian Season 2, sort of the culmination of the storyline up to that point, and I feel like The Mandalorian Season 4, plus all the other shows like Ahsoka and, you know, whatever else comes, are the start of the next big arc. This very much feels in the middle. And if we are going to get more sort of serialized Star Wars TV, I think it's okay that we have shows that have, you know, less big and flashy seasons. However, it's just a bit strange for The Mandalorian where we've had, you know, eight episodes this season and also a two-year break. And ultimately, I feel like some of this is due to the Book of Boa Fett drawing too much story from The Mandalorian. I feel like season three could have been better formatted if they hadn't touched that at all. Speaking of Boa Fett, with Bo-Katan now trying to reunify the Mandalorians, I would be surprised if he didn't show up at some point soon, or at least in the Book of Boba Fett Season 2. But speaking of showing up, we have, of course, the big star of this episode, a scene that I definitely loved, the appearance of one of my favorite characters in new Star Wars canon, Zeb Aurelius. Zeb, of course, first appeared in Star Wars Rebels. The credits did, in fact, confirm that, yeah, that was Zeb. And I gotta say, of all the Rebels crew, if you had asked me who would we see first in live action other than Chopper, I think Zeb would have been near the bottom of my list, maybe right above Ezra. The species is just hard to pull off, and I think they did a really good job. I think it was a completely CGI alien, but I was definitely expecting either Hera or perhaps even Sabine first, and this made me really excited because it's definitely hinting at the upcoming Ahsoka show, which by all accounts is going to be a Rebels sequel series. And I mean, maybe that is part of the reason why The Mandalorian is having these issues I discussed earlier, like that show is coming, it's going to be the big event, and we're sort of just treading water until then. But I still think the execution on an episode-to-episode -episode basis could be better. Again, it's not awful. It's not like Kenobi's execution issues, which really kneecapped the show, because I'm still enjoying my time watching The Mandalorian. I still really look forward to each episode every week, and almost every time after I've seen the episode, I enjoy it significantly more on my second watch, because I'm not sort of micro-analyzing every moment. But yeah, not quite the same magic of season one or season two for me so far, but I'm curious to see what they do in the final three episodes. Kind of insane to say that already. We're down to three episodes. But guys, that's all I have for me today. Again, we will be having a Bad Batch review video as soon as I can. You might be able to tell from my mic I'm not home right now. Really enjoyed those two episodes, even though they were definitely a bit different than I was expecting. But make sure you also follow my X Clips channel, ECKS Clips, because we do lots of breakdown videos, like four a day when the Mandalorian and the Bad Batch come out. But see you soon.